Mindful Coach Podcast. So welcome to this edition of the Mindful Coach Podcast. I'm your host, Brett Hill, and today we have with us none other than Dr. Sonja Olson, who is an extraordinary vet who has worked in healthcare, emergency room healthcare for veterinarians for a long time. And she and I have just been having a great time collaborating on some something we want to talk about in this episode. So uh, welcome back to the show, uh, Sonja. It's great to see you. Oh, I'm glad to be here, Brett. Thanks so much. We have been talking quite a lot about um, the work that's going on in the world or the lack thereof in some ways to help people have practical tools to be able to kind of, I sometimes call it gathering your bits or centering in the storm or, you know, finding ground in the midst of all this chaos. I mean, don't you think or do you feel like that in the world we have today where there's so much, you know, disturbing news that just seems to come at us all the time, that there's an impact on that on people's nervous systems and it can be disorienting. And there should be some skills, I think, and some skills training around how to manage yourself in a world that's just a continuous stream of bad news, it seems like that. And I know that you have direct personal experience with that because you worked in the emergency room for veterans. So I'd love for you to tell us about what have you learned or like your go-to practices to help in those really high-stress environment like that, that that has moved you to kind of do even more to kind of get the word outside of that context to the world in general. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for laying down that foundation, Brett. And you're absolutely correct that in today's landscape, there's a lot of stimuli, stimuli coming in. And when we tune in, we're human. So guess what we gravitate towards? Oh, the negative bits. We're not paying attention so much to the things that are positive and celebratory. Well, and thanks to our media <laughs> these days, neither are they. They are focusing on a lot of the negative, starting our human nature. So when I look at what I've learned over the course of time for myself, for my veterinary colleagues, when we're in an emergency caregiving environment, where the barrage of stimuli is constant, it is essential that we each individually and collectively have a responsibility, an ethical duty, if you will, to find a way to cope in a healthy way in the moment to regulate our emotions and our nervous systems so that we can function, so that we yeah. think clearly. We've got problem solving to do. We've got animals to take care of. And, and, and it matters, right? These And it matters, right? It matters hugely. And it matters hugely to the animals, to the families yes. that love them. And quite truthfully, when it comes right down to it, of course, it matters for us. So over time, there were things that I did figure out for myself, which did include mindfulness practices. I wish that I had known about them far earlier in my career mm -hmm. than I did. I had yoga breathing techniques. I learned more about grounding techniques. I feel like the really the opportunity to bring those strategies and practices towards people in the world, for them to grab hold of very practical in the moment, easy to access and use and apply, they're, they're there. And I found them for myself. I found myself mentoring and coaching it to my colleagues. And now I am doing that outside of the clinical environment, outside as a veterinary wellness educator and a mindfulness instructor and educator coach. So I've taken all of those strategies because I've seen now that there is such a need in the world mm -hmm. to help humans, and when humans are healthier and more balanced, they do less harm and they are better able to be their best selves. Mm. I love that very much, particularly when you say when we're, you know, more balanced and more mindful, we do less harm. I think one of the most important things that that phrase just jumped out for me. I think I was in a sound true inner MBA class and there they have this whole series on conscious CEOs that talk to the uh, um, the cohort. And one of them, and I have really looked and looked for this particular segment because I uh, wanted to quote her, but she said, I have a belief that mindful people do less harm. Yeah. And that just really stuck with me as one of the key foundations for my commitment, my personal commitment to mindfulness in my life and my professional life as well. 
And so there's that, like you just do less. I mean, I want to go back just a moment because when I was asking you about the, um, it, these decisions matter, I'm thinking, you know, here you are in a crisis situation. In your particular case, you know, you've got an animal who might be in a life threatening scenario and people have to make decisions that impact the, the life of this pet. And, and of course, the hearts of everyone involved. And those moments are really important to be as not disconnected from the drama, but not overwhelmed by it so that you can make the best decision you can make. Right. And in the moment. Right. So we're making the best yeah. decision that we can make at the moment. And I think that's a very important spot of recognizing we are human. Yeah. And we're not seeking perfect. We're not seeking our very best all the time. That's just not realistic. What is realistic is to recognize where am I at, where, and we talk about resourcing. How am I in my internal resourcing? How much sleep have I had? Have I had something to eat or drink? I don't know, am I in pain? Am I distracted by other things going on in my life? Um, I'm grieving, I'm dealing with whatever it may be. How resourced are you? And what's going on externally? Where are your resources? You are not alone. You are not alone. You are surrounded by other very caring humans in your personal life mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. in your professional life. It's a matter of us learning to connect, to be vulnerable, and to call in those compassionate common humanity practices. That's something that in the veterinary realm is not common. We're very mm -hmm. much stoic, very much suck it up buttercup, power on, <laughs> I've got to be tough. I don't ask for help. That's the way we were conditioned in our training. And I am delighted that that is changing for our upcoming right. vet nurses and doctors, as well as what's happening in the culture today out of necessity. We yeah. must change yeah. the culture. Yes. Yeah. And so there's that, that very important shift beginning to happen. And that's what I tell uh, members, people in the Mindful Coach Association and others. I say, this is a movement. This is not just about well, mindfulness is good for you, but it's a movement of professionals who are encouraging more centered, more connected, more heartfulness, more spaciousness, more, you know, groundedness in in our lives so that we can then make better decisions and influence others and do less harm in the process. And in that way, what particularly my particular motivation has been to help coaches ground in that coaches, therapists, you know, uh, veterinarians, <laughs> other people who show up um, for this work to be more mindful, present and compassionate, empathic in their in their work one on one and one on group so that they can then those people can then go about influencing other people. Because I think there's also a little bit of a, how should I how do I want to call this? Um, you know, when someone walks into the room and they're really agitated, it doesn't take long for you to kind of like pick up and your nervous system, they can show this neurologically, your nervous system starts to get agitated. Similarly, if you, what's it been like for you? Have you ever been in a situation where, um, I know you're holding what I call holding space a lot of times in these, these very difficult situations, but have you had been on the flip side where you're the one that's a little aggravated and somebody walks in the room and they're really solidly, you know, in a place where they're centered and calm and notice the impact of that on you. Have you ever had that happen to you? I wish it happened more frequently. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> so I, I admit to, um, the fact that I find that most folks are not paying attention. They are yeah. not self-aware enough to notice the energy exchange that's happening. So when you say that there is a movement needed, you're not kidding. We need more, <laughs> more self-aware folks in the world in lots of ways so that they're better partners, better parents, better mm -hmm. friends, family members, and professionals. When we are better attuned to here I am and this is what's happening for me, and then here's this other in front of me. Oh, what's going on here? And it gives us an opportunity, a space of curiosity that mm -hmm. really invites in a very open, compassionate space. That took practice as a practitioner for me to learn how to cultivate that. Mm -hmm. It was not taught <laughs> in veterinary yeah. by a long shot. It was something I cultivated. And then when I was starting to really focus on mindfulness practices, I could name it what I was doing without knowing mm -hmm. how it was cultivating that kind of a space. 
And now I go forward. And as you say, I am very invested in creating those ambassadors of holistic wellness, letting them know mm -hmm. that they already have the tools and the wisdom within them. Number one. Number two is that they just need to know how to access it and yeah. when and how that works for them. And they then can be in the place of coaching and peer supporters in the different spaces of our lives. That's how the movement propagates mm -hmm. efficiently and effectively. Mm -hmm. That's really well said. I love the ambassadors, the word about ambassadors, because that's, that's, that's a good word for that. I know for myself, it's like there are, uh, well, two things. One is like, uh, you're, you, I totally relate to what you're saying. Like, I wish there were more people that I had that response to. But often you're the one holding the most, uh, uh, you know, kind of, I call holding space or holding ground for whatever's going on around you. Uh, I don't often say this, but sometimes um, when I'm talking with people, I'll, I'll say, if you're the most mindful person in the room, you know it. And that can sound really egotistical in a way. But it's actually intended to be more of an observation mm -hmm. because when you are the one who's one of the things that happens when you're really being present and centered and you're you're experiencing all the people around you and whenever you experience them in a very. I don't want to say like purely objective mechanical way, but in a more full spectrum way, heart, mind, body a soul and even, you know, and you're really in a human way and you experience everyone around you is kind of like distracted and anxious and, um, on, uh, and they're just really not putting a lot of thought into whatever's going on. They're not pausing to be present with their moment that stands out in a way. And I'm not judging them. It's just, I'm just noticing. It's not like, Oh, they're bad or they're wrong. It's just like, Oh, everybody seems a little agitated or a little reactive to things. And then if you can, and if you're scanning the room and you meet somebody and they and you kind of connect with them and they see you and you see them and you notice that you're checking each other out and you're kind of like, Oh, okay. Here's somebody who's not hurried. Who's taking time to survey the land to be present. You notice each other. There's a moment of connection there where you go, ah, there's someone who's paying attention and in a more centered way. And in that way, you can identify and sense, if you will, who around you is bringing presence to their moment, like you're trying to do. And in that way, you gravitate and kind of sort sort through. Anyway, that was kind of a little sideline here. Um, but the other part of what you said, which I really appreciated, was um, being an ambassador. And then you're, you put yourself in a position where you're actually teaching people in your field how to bring these skills into their profession. And so uh, tell us a little bit about that work, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Not only because it was so directly and personally impactful and empowering for me in the, in the busiest and the most challenging of clinical environments, you know, to be in an ER specialty practice, high volume, high expectations of parents yeah. um, and of colleagues. Let's be clear. There's also a lot of expectations that come from leadership and colleagues so a lot of pressure, yeah. And so talk about um, having to figure it out and in a way, now so so many though, this is the other part of this, Brett, is that not just in my field, but in many fields, when you do not have strategies, that is when we have people who yeah. suffer mental health concerns and crises. They end up finding themselves burned out from the, the work that they do. Occupational and psychological distress can overwhelm. And not many people know that veterinary medicine is one of the professions that has a very high rate of suicidal ideation. Oh, suicide. my goodness. Today is World Suicide Prevention Day. I don't oh. know if you do that, but it's a really So this is like a September 10th, 24, September 10th right? September is World Suicide <laughs> Prevention Day. And today is a perfect day for us to be talking about how do we, as individuals, fortify ourselves to meet the moments and so that we can respond healthfully and know that we are not alone mm -hmm. and how can we provide that to others around us and that is what i am seeking to do is to create mm. this network of compassionate souls who have deep compassion for animals and i'm just asking them to extend that <laughs> to themselves as well as to yes, exactly around right. them because they do it all the time it's just pointing right. to what they do already and, mm -hmm. and bringing it towards them 
in a strengths-based way, saying you already know how to do this. And it makes a difference for you and for all the humans around you if you're able to hold space in a meaningful and authentic way, not in an artificial, what we know, way that isn't where you're at. Don't do that necessarily, right? But be your authentic self. And if you are in a space of lean resources yourself, knowing that, knowing that and being honest about that. And so when we look at folks being the place of challenge in their lives, whether it's in the veterinary environment or whether it's another professional space or life space, having a place of calm and centeredness for yourself to check in, having that be a regular practice of how am I doing today? And I love this question. What do I need? It's so mm -hmm. rare, so rare that we pause long enough to ask ourselves that and not what you want. What do you need? And maybe allow yourself to find it, to ask for it. Yeah. To make room for it. And that's not easy. That's a, that's a practice in and of itself. Mm -hmm, to know that you mm -hmm. are worth and deserve. Carry yourself. That is one of the biggest lessons that I feel like I'm having to bring towards these very selfless, generous caregivers is that they too deserve care. It's a big shift for their brains and hearts. So mm -hmm. I'm very pleased to be in a space of allies globally that are having the conversation. So wouldn't it be great if you could take those same skills and in the technical term, there's, in the technical world, there's thing lift and shift, lift and shift them into other worlds. And, um, and so, you know, in full disclosure, you know, Sanjay and I have been talking about that exact process. Like she's got this deep skill set, as you can hear, on how to bring, you know, some resourcefulness and resilience and presence into these high stress scenarios. And in my work as a mindful somatic coach and coach trainer, and also I've got a long history and a bunch of other stuff, you know, martial arts and um, as well as, uh, you know, many kinds of body work that bring you into the present moment. Um, plus, a, you know, big background in somatic psychotherapy training uh, in Hakomi. Um, taking those tools and synthesizing a way for people to practice skills that you can use in high stress scenarios to kind of get yourself into a place where you're not being reactive, where you're more resourced and you're more present. So Sanjay and I have been uh, brainstorming and working together. And we're actually putting together a course that I'm so excited about uh, called Censored in the Storm. And this course is intended to provide the people who take it with a set of very manageable, short, repeatable, powerful skills that you can do on demand. And I'm just really excited to be to be uh, working on this project with you, Sanjo. So, uh, what what say a few words, if you will, about uh, the the idea that we have here of like the the power of these short, powerful skills or repeatable skills to kind of sometimes I call it bringing your bits together to help you be more present in the moment. I love that. Yep. So that what we started brainstorming around is was exactly this, is that, wow, there's so much reactivity in the world right now, and it's only getting amped up, particularly in the United States, as we head into our political season, as it will. But that's not the only thing going on. It's just extra. <laughs> right? <laughs> just extra a bonus. Of whatever else we're already working through in our lives. But there's also a lot of other things happening in the world that even if we are being, and I love the term empathic discernment, when you're being careful about mm -hmm. how much information you're letting in and noticing whether it serves you or whether it's disturbing you. So even mm -hmm. if you're being in a place of empathic discernment, you're still going to get stirred up. And there's a lot that's going on that might do that. So I, that's, you know, empathic discernment is a tool that folks can pay attention to. That's immediately available to you. And between both Brett and I, we both have a lot of interest in utilizing the body's wisdom. So between somatic sensing and intuition, there's those spaces. And there's also your deep wisdom within your polyvagal nervous system. This is very important as part of grounding techniques, breath techniques, which we can draw from yoga. We can draw that from polyvagal wisdom, as well as from some of the systems and structures that Brett is trained in. So we're wanting to bring things that you're breathing anyway. Ah, so might we utilize the breath 
to serve us in the moment, whether it is to calm us, center us, energize us, emotionally regulate us. We can use our bodies in such a way that we can practice. What does this feel like when? So just bringing that attention to it, being able to name it so that when we name it, it's better able to be seen, validated and moved. So we're just practicing the noticing and then normalizing and then resourcing with grabbable tools that you know work for you. But mm -hmm. part of this is just raising awareness yeah, and, and, yeah. and fortifying your toolbox. So I think that's really where we're excited to spend time. Yeah, um, I'm really psyched about this because the the things we have in mind for this course are going to be so powerful. I, I'm, I get really noticing I'm, my own nervous system, some, you know, uh, limbic system is lighting up because I'm, if I could only communicate how effective some of these techniques have been in saving my life um, and also in being of service to the world, um, then, it, then I wouldn't, you know, it would be amazing if I could communicate that, but I, but I can just say that uh, these are exceptionally, mm, these, are, these are diamonds that you can have, that you can just use to, to really bring yourself into a state of presence on demand, on request. So these are skill. These are my go-to skills for whenever. Uh, if I if I just witnessed a car wreck or I was just in one. If you just get laid off. If you just had a breakup. You got bad news. If you if someone near you is like ill unexpectedly and you're just all discombobulated. These are my go-to skills. Not to distance myself from the impact, but I don't want. To, but I want to be able to be an effective human being in the midst of all this chaos. If we back up just for a moment, because you were mentioning some very powerful influencers on our life, which is the overwhelming amount of um, stimuli that we get from climate change, from the political environment, from economics, from, oh my God, how am I going to manage my taxes? And what am I going to do about my my car that's breaking down? And how am I going to pay X, you know, what about my job and uh, all the layoffs that are happening and whatever it is that's in the field, in the box of things that I'm worried about today, there are a lot of people putting in, uh, you know, loading that box up. And so that has an impact on us all. And so we're all walking around as a, as a country, as a, as a, in the, actually in the world in many ways, with our um, too much pressure in the hose, right? And and so the, it's how do you manage that? How do you walk through the world in a way where you can have a great life, a great moment in a world where there's simply too much noise and there's too much. And it's not that it doesn't matter because a lot of it's very really important. Climate change matters. Politics matters. The fact that you might lose your work, your job, those things matter. And so, as I sometimes say, in a world that is has unlimited difficulty and unlimited trouble, unlimited suffering, which there is, there's unlimited amount of suffering in the world and unlimited beauty, unlimited goodness. Who do you choose to be? Who do you choose to be? And that is a very powerful question. And so this workshop is designed to help you make that choice. Because if you don't make the choice, if you, and you don't have a choice if your nervous system is overrun, you're just on automatic. And that's not wrong. It's just not necessarily the place you want to be. So these are somatic tools, including breath. What are some of the other um, uh, focuses that we're going to have in this workshop, uh, Sonia? I think that it's beautiful to some things that I just hear you saying that I think is also helpful is being present for your life. You've got one crack at this, folks. <laughs> so are you going to spend the time up in your head, believing mm. your thoughts, believing that your emotions are real and have that much power over you? Or are you going to take back some control? That's the other piece that I think that we are trying to invite folks into is the space of having some real say over who you are and how you want to live your life rather than being hijacked into this internal space of worry concern, anxiety, and stress. There are choices to be made. 
And so I think that's an important piece to bring forward. So utilizing awareness, utilizing also the places of somatic sensing, knowing what emotions feel like in your body and what your thought processes do. It's just the practice. These are all very strong mindfulness buckets, right? It's body mm -hmm. thought mm -hmm. awareness, emotional awareness. And then there's the next space, which is one of my favorites, which is the space of patterns. And when you put it all together, spaces around like loving kindness and around mm -hmm. equanimity and radical acceptance. These are really incredible spaces to explore because they give us the chance to take all of those areas of awareness that we're developing and do something with them. Choosing to be your most authentic, heart-centered, value-driven human self in the moments that are beautiful and that are challenging. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the invitation. So mm -hmm. I, I invite us regularly <laughs> to work on this. And the workshop is going to be a beautiful place for um, Brett and I to bring this together in a more focused way for folks that are looking to build out their toolboxes now because they recognize it would be helpful. Yeah, I sometimes think of um, this as the, I've had on my board over here, like a workshop I want to do called Mindful Triage. And it's and it's kind of like this is really in that direction, because um, I have this notion that's embedded in this course of, I call touchstones. And the reason I call them touchstones is because there are specific somatic things that I do that I have wired up over the years to be connected to memories that serve me to bring my bits together when I'm under stress. So if I, so this happens all the time. I use this technique. There's one that's, uh, I just call a centering breath. And that's something we're going to be doing in this workshop as an example. I am a little kind of neurodivergent and, uh, in this, so I'll go into a, a, a store sometimes and, just a regular store like, you know, Target or Costco. And I'll just start to get like, oh, my God, I feel tunnel vision happening. And I feel um, like I can't see around me because it's just too much. It starts to be like there's just too much visual chaotic noise. It's just a noisy environment. And I'm not always like that. But when I am like that, one of the things I know that helps me and I'm, is to simply I'll stop First, I have to notice, I have to stop, and then I'll take a breath, and I'll just do what I call a centering breath, and that's where I just I just take a breath. And this is, comes from martial arts, and I have this sense of being very physically centered in gravity, meaning not right or left, not forward or back, not leaning forward, but centered. And I take a breath and I just come to center. And it's also from meditation. I have a centered spot that I use in the middle of my head. And it doesn't matter where it is. It could be anywhere. Your heart is a good one. And when I do that, I immediately feel more spacious. And I just take a moment to sense my entire body, my entire situation. Take a breath. Relax. And then I just come back to the world and I'm in a better place. And it takes two and a half seconds. And it really, really has helped. I've used that when I've been in emergencies, when someone starts to yell at me, when I start to feel I'm, I'm believe it or not, even though I'm the mindful coach, I'm a pretty reactive guy by nature. And I had to work really hard to not be as reactive as I am. So when people are critical of me, there's a part of me that really doesn't like that. Take a breath, relax. It's not about me. And it has changed my life radically. And emergencies, like a fire alarm goes off in the middle of the building. What do you do? People are panicking. Um, and I'm like doing my sending breath, looking around. Is there smoke? How, what's the danger? <laughs> you know, where's the exit? I'm taking a beat and making a rational decision. These have been extremely powerful tools. And uh, we hope to give people a somatic, direct experience, not just an idea, not just a here, go home and practice this, but we're going to do these things in a way where you get it. Because once you get it physically, it's really hard to unlearn the value of those things.
So I've got my own set of uh, specialties. I know Sonja, what are some of the things you want to bring to the to the to the group that we're working with, Sonja? What's one of your your the things you want people to to really embody and take away? Yeah. So I mentioned, for example, our amazingly powerful polyvagal nervous system. So I yeah. absolutely bring in some polyvagal practices that are evidence based. They are proven and they are effective. So can you say just a word about, for those listeners who may not know what polyvagal sure. is? Absolutely. So um, m- some of you may know, but many people don't know that you have this incredible other nervous system. You have your sympathetic nervous system, fight, freeze, fawn, et cetera, right? We know that one. And then we have our parasympathetic nervous system, your rest and digest system. There's a third. And actually, quite truthfully, there's actually a fourth, which we're not going to be mm-hmm. talking about in this one. <laughs> but there's, well, it's, it's beautiful to know how much research we are finding is wisdom in our body. So the fourth one that we're not going to be working on is your enteric nervous system, your gut brain axis. Oh yeah. That's, that's really big it's these a days. Very beautiful and separate conversation, but this polyvagal nervous system is part of your vagal um, wisdom. That is your social nervous system. This is integrated in the muscles of your face and through your throat and across your heart and through your lungs and chest and into your belly and there are parts that are older. There are parts that are more recently evolved. What's really important is that they're connecting your sympathetic and your, your parasympathetic nervous systems and your brain and your gut. So we're able to do things. For an example, people might laugh about doing something like this, but smile. I mean, really <laughs> smile like, oh, my gosh, everything is terrific. Oh, it's so good. Not only is that funny and it makes you laugh, but that stretching action of the muscles of your face sends signals to your nervous system as well as little neurotransmitters and hormones that if you're smiling like that, things might be all right and you are safe mm. than maybe your nervous system believes. So if you are feeling yourself caught up and swept away by when you're in traffic and you're really getting hijacked by, I don't like this, I don't have control over this. I'm speaking from experience. <laughs> uh, I get really frustrated when I don't feel like I can move. Right. I move into the space of like that sympathetic, oh, awareness of, oh, here it comes. This is what I do when I get stuck in traffic. So I, I laugh, I smile. And if you hum or sing, you're vibrating. Oh, humming. Your oh, that's heart, interesting. That will vibrate the vagal nerves through your throat. So there are stretching, Mm -hmm. there are activities, there are breathing techniques, there are movements of your body that invite in vagal tone. And vagal tone invites parasympathetic nervous system joining in to help balance the sympathetic edginess that your nervous system may be experiencing. So we'll practice some really helpful techniques around that. I'll also invite in a little bit more of a philosophical, but there's also an experiential part of it around letting go and letting be. As oh, part yeah. of radical acceptance. And what is it that I really genuinely can control? What is it that I can influence? And what genuinely is not mine? Well, so, I mean, I just want to, like, speak uh, um, on behalf of, like, listeners who might go, well, this, what's this, this idea of radical acceptance? Does that mean that if, you know, uh, somebody comes out in politics, uh, uh, you know, and is, like, viciously attacking other people that I need to be okay with that? Absolutely not. It does not mean you condone. It doesn't mean that you have to approve of. It simply recognizes that this is your journey and that's their journey. Your value sets are clearly very different. It doesn't mean that you have to be okay with, nor do you have to let yourself go into a place of fight and get upset and angry about it. Is that the best use of your energy? Is it really going to make a difference? If you are really moved to do something, what's the most effective way that you can apply that energy It may be that you get active in your community. It may be that you get really active in education in some way. You you direct it in a way that speaks to your values and the importance of it to you. So you're not dismissing that. It's what can you actually do that will have a positive impact and is in alignment with your authentic self and values. When we let go, that's when I don't have any control over this. I'm getting reactive around it and it's not mine put it down. It's not mine. Letting be means maybe not right now. Maybe I don't have enough information. We don't have enough information. This is simply where we are in terms of resources. We're putting it down for the moment, agreeing Mm -hmm. that we're going to come back to it. 
Yeah. It's a really helpful spot for us individually, but also for all the relationships in our lives, letting it be. So I think there are just some spaces to bring people's attention to and so that they see the spectrum of opportunities that it's not so black and white. There's a lot of gray, a lot of gray. Mm -hmm. I sometimes like to talk about this. Uh, th- that was really nice. Thank you. Uh, I sometimes I sometimes talk about this from uh, um, I'm, m- my thoughts turn to Eckhart Tolle, who talks about this to, to, uh, in, in some length. And one of the things is uh, an example I use is let's imagine that you're on your way to um, get on a plane and you have a flat tire. And so you're going to miss your plane. And so. The notion of acceptance to me is, and where it can serve me, is what then do I want, what moment do I want to have? What kind of life experience do I want to have in that moment? I can choose, and there's nothing wrong with it, and it's not, I'm not saying it's wrong, but I could choose, oh, dang it, I'm going to lose all that money on the plane ticket, and why does this always happen to me, and it's just ridiculous, I couldn't, I should have got the thing, and they should have fixed the tires, and they didn't do it, and so I'm just a complete victim here, and now I'm missing out on all this stuff. I'm living in a pretty unhappy, stressed out place. Now, that does not get the tire fixed. It doesn't keep the plane on the ground. It doesn't make my future better. It doesn't make my moment better. But it is all true, necessarily. It might not all be true. So, is but is that the moment that I want to have? And so acceptance to me is more like, okay, this is a fact. This has occurred, right? The car had a flat. I missed the plane. So now what's it? Oh, can, did you look at that tree? That is an amazing tree. Or look at that full moon. That is incredible. I want to be available for those experiences that are beautiful, even in the midst of the storm. And that's the core part of this, is to help people have better moments. Sometimes I say, your life is nothing but a, but a series of moments. And so taking ownership of what's the quality of that moment, of your moments. And these are tools that help people have better moments, even in the middle of the storm. And you're not denying anything. You're not saying you're not going to fix the flat. So radical acceptance isn't, oh, I'm stuck at the side of the road, and I'm just going to sit here in my car and not do anything about it because my moment is so beautiful. Right. You're not going to sit there and meditate <laughs> the moment away. I mean, that's not going to make things better. <laughs> meditate the problem away. Feel right? better and, and center you, but it's when we say radical acceptance, it's like radical candor is another, yeah. like, you know, different space, but it points to the opportunity to shift your thinking about that, about candor. Clear as kind, as Brene Brown would say. Moving into mm, the space love that. of authenticity and honesty is radical candor. Moving somebody forward with tough compassion, love that as well. Tough love. So you're moving somebody forward by being clear, not complacent, not placating, and and feeding you know sugar <laughs> sugar coated moments. Sugar coating it right. We're not so, talking yeah. about that. Sometimes life sucks. Sometimes life sucks. That's and, a, and that's a fact, right? And that's a fact. You can say, you know what? I I really am not enjoying this. I didn't want this. I didn't ask for this. And in this moment, this sucks. Or, ouch, this hurts. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually in a place of emotional or physical pain, psychological pain. I'm, I'm really, I'm suffering. Okay. Yeah. That's actually part of radical acceptance as well as naming what is so. That's and, maybe what is so. And yeah. the next breath, as Tara Brock would say, and this too. In my and life, this, mm-hmm. we have the capacity, each and every one of us, to hold more than we can possibly believe. We are more mm-hmm. resilient than we give ourselves credit for. You have more bandwidth and energetic capability than you might imagine. You can hold it. And when we don't struggle and we don't try to push experiences away or try to shift them in a particular direction, that's radical acceptance and equanimity together. There's less pain and suffering because we're simply in the space of this is so and. And I love that, right? So it's, there's a whole thing also you'll see around, uh, if you look around, if you're in the mindfulness world like I am, you notice trends. And one of the things is mindful activism. And so it's like <clears throat> mindfulness can lead you into effective activism instead of reactionary like 
really empowered, impassioned, connected, grounded activism that has the power to not only solve problems, but connect us to our humanity into a sustainable future. And that is what we're up to, folks. And so I wanted to just say, um, oh, my God, this is so exciting. I can't wait to do this. And for those of you um, in the Portland, Oregon area, we're doing this workshop at the New Renaissance Bookstore October 5th. Saturday, uh, starting at 1130 a.m. And there will be links to it in the show notes, as well as you can connect with Sonja and, and, and all of her great work. Um, and so this is an in-person, not a virtual workshop. And we, you know, we don't know if, if there'll be a series of these, but we sure hope uh, it goes somewhere and we're having a great time doing it. And but we are committed to providing a fabulous experience for people that can really help people mm, in pro- significant ways. And, uh, you know, someone just bringing amazing experience from her work and I'm bringing the best that I've learned from some fabulous trainers and teachers over the years. Uh, and also, if you noticed, and one of the things I love about Sonja and her work is that she's really rooted in the neurology of this. And so this is a lot of science in what we're doing here. And you're going to really benefit from these practices in uh, even if you just take one of them away one of these touchstone practices away and so uh um, i just want to say it's so fun working with you Sonja, and i really appreciate the work you're doing and can't wait to uh uh to do this workshop and we'll see what else happens from it um what would you like to say in closing i would love to say that i'm equally excited and it's also an opportunity for us to learn from our participants isn't it I absolutely mean, oh my god that's yes. the best bits is when we do it together we learn we we pick up new techniques and tips we understand things from a new perspective and there's wisdom that is gained from just opening up our minds and our hearts mm. to how are mm. we navigating this i'm very much mm. looking forward to the learning as much as i am to helping support folks so <laughs> Correct. I'm melting over here. It's so beautiful. Thank you so much. All right. So that's it for this edition of the Mindful Coach podcast. And I hope that you've enjoyed this conversation. Um, reach out to Sonja. Reach out to me. Uh, check out the MindfulCoachAssociation.com if you're aligned with what we're doing here, because this is just, uh, you know, one of many of the uh, efforts that are going on. I've been working on the events calendar for the association, right? And oh, my God, there's so much good stuff going. Check it out. And um, we hope to meet you in Portland or hear from you online. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank you. The Mindful Coach Podcast is a service of the Mindful Coach Association.